time I heard that song. Thank you very much. All right. <clears throat> How many uh, like your Bible? Amen. How many love your Bible? Amen. There you go. Yeah, there you go. That's right. Well, it does say, love the Lord thy God with all thy love, heart, soul, mind, and strength. But over in <clears throat> Isaiah, let's stand and start with uh, <clears throat> verse 11. If you've been saved for any amount of time, you're familiar with this verse. Sometimes we do forget that we know this verse. So God says here through Isaiah, the prophet, around 700 years before Jesus Christ, so shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please. And it shall prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. So Lord, we thank you for this wonderful verse that tells us how powerful our Bible is. And uh, no matter what we think about it or why, while others are trying to change it to make it easy instead of serious, we are, thank you that you remind us that you're going to, your, your word is going to accomplish that which you sent it to do. So we ask you to use us in this accomplishment now in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Be seated. The word became flesh as you turn into John chapter 1, 700 years after this. We go to John chapter 1 because he said, My word will accomplish. And my word, if you read earlier verses before that one, God says, His ways are higher than our ways, and neither can you know them. And so when we really think that we know a lot about God, we, we really haven't even begun yet. I mean, I, they, they're said, they just launched this uh, super telescope. Yesterday, I believe it was, I finally got it. It's, how many have kept up with it? It's the Webb Telescope. It's 100 times more powerful than the Hubble Telescope. And they're going to, it's going to go for billions and billions of miles to, to hopefully get to the beginning of all of creation. <laughs> and it opens like a football field of special uh, developed, like Mylar, it's, it's, it's an amazing thing, and it's, it's now on its way. But it doesn't matter what, it, what uh, photographs and videos it gets. God said, my ways are higher than your ways, and neither can you know them. Right. Because God doesn't live in the seen world. He lives in the unseen world. People that die, they pass over. They don't, they, they don't live like they live here, there. But it doesn't matter what man comes up with, he's still not going to know anything about God except the, create, the whole creation is made so that we can understand how powerful and majestic God is. And no matter what we try to describe God, we, we, we don't come close. The eye is not seen and ear is not heard. Neither has entered into the imagination of the hearts of men the things that God has prepared for them that love him. So in, first, in John, we see here, uh, as we end this uh, birth of Christ season again, then uh, John 1, 1 says, In the beginning was the, what? Word. Capital W, Word, and the Word, capital, was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. And then verse 14 is the birth of Christ. And the word was made like you and me. We're just flesh. The word was made flesh and dwelt among us. We beheld his glory and the glory of the glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace <clears throat> and truth. So it is the what they call the incarnation of the word. The word became flesh. And that's what the Christmas season is supposed to be about. I imagine that the malls are full right now. People are hustling back to exchange their gifts and, and uh, go here and there and 
Sundays have become just another commercial day, traffic jams and car wrecks. But it is the incarnation of the word, verse 14. Now, how many know Christians that just don't seem to be obedient to the Bible? You know anybody that's a Christian does not seem to be obedient to the Bible? Yeah. I think every one of us does if we think about it. <laughs> but uh, some people, many years ago I wrote, some people see the Bible as the words of God and try to better interpret it. While the wisest people see the Bible as God the Word and are better at obeying it not trying to interpret it according to fit the moment that we're in, fit the current trend of what Christians should believe. So even in Bible college, I could see that coming. The Bible is God's the words of God, the principle, they would call them the principles of the Bible, of the thoughts of the Bible or the concepts of the Bible. But Jesus told the devil himself, the man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Amen. That's how particular the word of God is, not the concepts of God or the principles of God. We don't need to water it down. We just need to obey it and see folks really saved and miracles really happen. So we see here that it's called the Word of God. He, and he said, I will send my Word and it will accomplish. So we just don't need to continually improve it. We just need to obey it and watch it work. They say the Bible is like a lion. Just let him out of the cage and he'll do his own business. You don't have to help a lion. Go to Proverbs 30 and we'll quickly see four things here this morning about the Word of God. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. So, Christ came, the word came and took on the form of flesh. And now he's gone back, he's sitting on the right hand of the Father. And we have Jesus Christ here. We have him here, I hear, I'm listening to the pages turn. See, that is... That's who Jesus is right now. He's gone back to be the Word. He left being the Word and came and became flesh, and he's gone back now. All we have, the only thing we have, physical, that is Jesus is his Word in our hands right now. He left us this, and they've tried to exterminate the Bibles, change the Bibles, water them down, but guess what? The Word of God is still on this earth doing its work. Chapter 30 is uh, a chapter that has a lot of wisdom in it, of course. But this section is about the Word of God. Proverbs 30, verse 5 to 9, we'll look at it. So we see four things uh, from verse 5 to 9 about the Word of God. Four major things that the Word will do for us. The Bible is here for us, amen? That's wonderful, the promises. First we see out of these four things in verse 5a, just a little sliver there, the Word of God will purify us. When we read God's Word and memorize God's Word, obey God's Word, it will purify us. It says there in 5a, every principle, every concept, what is it really? Every Word of God is what? Pure. That's a mouthful, isn't it? Every word is pure. That's why wise Christians don't tamper with the word of God. Amen. So that we do not bring impurities of man's thoughts to replace what God has already written. Those who translated the Bible we use here, the old Bible, the real Bible, when they were allowed to translate from the Geneva Bible and the older versions that were in Europe, they took meticulous care. Not to, uh, the translations today are trying to make it easier to understand. 
they, they, they copied it to make it clearer to understand what was there. Yeah. Not to make it easier for the time that they lived. And that is the difference with the translations of today. To make it easier rather than make it just plain clear. This is what God wants. 30 verse 9, uh, 5, excuse me, says, now look quickly, turn left and go a few pages to Psalm uh, 12, and you'll see it's a continuing theme all through the scriptures of the purity of the word of God. An interesting verse, 12, Psalm 12, verse 6 and 7, says the words of the Lord are what? Pure words, 12, 6 of Psalms, as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation, how long? Forever. Jesus said, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. Now, if you look at Psalm 119, we have uh, verse 9 through 11, 119, verse 9 through 11 of the purity. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? 119, verse 9. How you, will you cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto according to thy word. My whole heart have I sought thee. Oh, let me not wander from thy commandments. Thy word have I hid in mine heart that I might not sin against God. So we see the word of God will purify us if we let it. Quickly jump to John 15, verse 3. The purity is Jesus brings us forth. And uh, if you didn't get saved this way, you didn't get saved at all. John chapter 15 and verse number 3. Jesus tells those listening to him here, now ye are clean through the what? Word. Through the word which I have spoken unto you. Mm -hmm. We must be careful not to try to get folks saved without the word of God. God. We can say, I'll oh, just ask Jesus in your heart. They, they don't even know that Jesus said to do that. You know, we, they must. They must have an understanding. Ask people, do you, do you believe the Bible? Uh, I, don't, I, I don't know. Some said, no, nah, not really. Would you like to go to heaven? Oh, yeah. Are they going to heaven if they don't believe the Bible? I'm waiting for a loud answer out there. No. If they don't, they, you've got to be cleansed through the Word. So talk to That's why our Christians are to memorize the Word of God. So when we're talking to people, we... We just tell them what the Bible says as it's written. They must hear the word of God to be clean from their sins. And then lastly, look at 1 Peter 1.22 here. 1 Peter 1.22. And he says here, seeing you have purified, there's that word. Seeing you have purified, 1 Peter 1.22. Seeing you have purified your souls, how? In obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love, that's, that means pure love here, unfeigned love of the brethren. See that you love one another with a what? A pure heart, fervently. Amen. So first we see that the, uh, out of these four major things the Word will do for us, accomplish for us and we see that it will purify us first of all secondly go back to proverbs and let's read some more of that so we get back to proverbs chapter 30 as we'll come back if we finish those few verses so proverbs 30 and verse 5b secondly we see not only will it purify us the word will protect us as well it says here, every word of God is pure, and then protection. He is a shield unto them that put their trust in him. Yeah. The word of God will also protect us. Yeah. Satan, when he wanted to destroy Job's life, 
He said, I can't, I can't get to Job. You have a hedge built around him. Remember that? And so when Christians will not obey God and they want to live life on their own, even if they're saved, when that hedge comes down, you, you are totally without any protection from God. You are on your own. And you are, and I are no match for the likes of Satan. Amen. Amen. Sometimes we unconsciously wander. You know, we have a song, I wander, I've wandered far away from God. Now I'm coming home. Amen. So look at, uh, secondly, we see, go back to Psalm 119. There's so much there. Psalm 119 tells us about the protection of God as well. Verse 92, there's 176 verses. It's the longest passage in the Bible, is Psalm 119. And almost every verse deals with the Word of God. Almost all of those, I think, it, how many, Russ, is it not? Five, five verses, maybe? It's, a, it's the whole thing is about the Word of God. So, 119.92, about protection here. Unless thy law, that's the word, had been my delights, I should then have perished in my affliction. <coughs> it wasn't for the Bible, he said, there'd be nothing left to me. Verse 95. <coughs> the wicked have waited for me to destroy me, but I will... Consider thy testimonies. Yeah. He said, when the going gets rough, I just <clears throat> go back to the Bible. Yeah. Remember old J. Vernon McGee? Is he the one who had back to the Bible broadcast, I believe it was, yeah. many for many years on the radio. 98 to 100 here, 11998. Thou through thy commandments hast made me wiser than mine enemies. They are ever with me, meaning the commandments. Then he goes on, I have more understanding, so he's wiser with the word. I have more understanding in all my teachers, for well, their testimonies are my meditation. I understand more than the ancients, because I keep thy precepts. So he says, I know the word, and I obey the word, and therefore I am protected. Let's finish up here in 105 and 107. 105 says, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. And then 107 says, I am afflicted very much. Quicken me, means give me life. O Lord, according unto thy word. So we have this wonderful psalm here of 176 verses. But the, everything we're studying is all found in that Psalm 119. All of it and all the benefits that God has, he, he brings it out in the word commandments and statutes and laws and the word. Thirdly, let's go on back and see what else he has to say here. So we'll take a right and go back to Proverbs 30. And now we see third, not only will it, the word purify us, will it protect us, the word will also prove us, see what we're made of. The word reprove is used here. And so he says, uh, verse 6, Add thou not unto what? His words. Why? Lest he reprove thee, thou be found a liar. We've, we've mentioned some of the different versions which we now call perversions, even the best ones out there, change the meaning of certain texts. That we've, we've, not just the word, but the entire meaning of the sentence structure. Not just commas and exclamation points, but the thought itself is missing from the Bibles that we have. But he says here, not to two things, uh, add not unto his words, lest he reprove thee, and thou be found a liar. And I said many years ago <clears throat> that I would probably go to a newer translation 
if he could show me the holiness of God in the life of those Christians. But we have yet to see, we've seen the disintegration of society and Christianity and things allowed in churches that the Bible condemns, by the way. So we need the proof that God is moving to change his word. But just because a publishing house gets it and makes millions and millions of dollars pushing that, and then that's not good enough because another one's right behind it going to a publishing house to make more millions and millions than the one you bought and really is, we don't use that anymore. Aren't you glad we have the real word of God? Amen. One guy said, it's too hard to understand. So what part of it is it you're not going to obey anyway? Do you understand what repent means? Do you understand what blessing means? Do you understand what prayer means? You know, we don't, we don't have to be linguistic experts to obey what we do understand. What Mark Twain said, it's not what I don't understand in the Bible that bothers me, it's what I do understand in the Bible that bothers me. <laughs> So we have uh, Psalm 119, we can finish it, protect it, prove us. Look at uh, 119.89, we'll move quickly. Go back to 119 for our last time here. 119 and verse number 89. And this is about God proving us. He says, don't mess with the Bible. We saw that in Proverbs. So we see here, forever, O Lord, thy what? Word. Word is settled in heaven. Man can change it all he wants to, but it doesn't change what we will be judged by in eternity. When they stand before the great white throne judgment, that which was established to begin with will be what the lost are judged by. And also the works of the Christian at, at the uh, judgment seat of Christ will go back to the original words that God laid out. We'll say, well, I didn't, my Bible never said that. And, he, and God won't care. It's what he established here. Wherever, O oh Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. Amen. Now, Hebrews 4.12 we're talking about the power of the word, the longevity of the word. Hebrews 4, 12. You remember when, uh, before you were saved, when you were under conviction of your sin and you started feeling the sting of the thought of going to hell? Turn, you may, may have had a TV show come on, a Christian broadcast, and you turn the channel or radio you turn the channel and you try to escape, uh, you might say, the Word of God in every form, but you couldn't get away from it because look what 412 says. For they, what? Singular, the whole body of God's truth. Well, the Word of God is quick, meaning alive. This book is a living book. It is the only book on earth. We have AI technology, artificial intelligence, which is taking over our lives. You just don't realize how intricate this stuff is. Every advertisement, every microsecond is already there to influence your brain, by the way. Yeah. I just saw last night where the Chinese government is developing uh, implants for the brain so that the soldiers can operate weapons without even touching them. This is a new technology, and our government is already uh, sanctioning maybe 32 companies that are helping the Chinese develop this. Well, think about the Mark of the Beast coming up. Uh, in their foreheads, it says there, it doesn't about the Mark, in their forehead. We, we're seeing sh some <laughs> supernatural things on this earth, demonic things. That was really big news yesterday, but people weren't watching the news. So the Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, 
and the joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Remember when we started reading our Bible after we got saved and it really started coming alive and now as we read it's still alive 50 years later, 60 years later. Anybody here been saved 70 years yet? We have some getting close to that. But it says, neither is there any creature that is not made known or manifest in his sight. For all things are naked and open unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. We have to deal with God like it or not. And people are running from the word, changing the word, uh, excusing the word, and mistranslating the word on purpose. But the word of God will prove us and reprove us. 1 Peter 1.23 1 Peter 1.23 We were there in 22. And it says about the word of God reproving us, correcting us, convicting us. It says being born again, 123 of 1 Peter. Being born again Anybody here been born again? Yes, sir. <laughs> I had a Catholic lady when I was young selling furniture somewhere after I got saved. She was telling me about being born again and, and then finally I was giving my testimony. She finally said, well, Dennis, she said, uh, uh, we're charismatic Catholics. Uh, what does being born again really mean? So she was praising the Lord in the furniture store and I was like 29 years old. And, uh, and I was just telling her about my Christian life and how God had changed me. And then she, I said, have you ever been born again? She said, I guess evidently not. Yeah. But she was happy about God. But it says being born again, not of corruptible seed, something of man, but of incorruptible by the word of God which liveth and abideth forever. Praise the Lord. Now, let's look at the very end of the Bible, Revelation 22. Another last warning about messing with the Word of God, particularly here, the Revelation of John. And so 22, verse 18, lastly in this third point, <clears throat> We see the warning there in Proverbs, but we see the warning again at the end of the Bible, just in case. 22.18, the Revelation. So John says, For I testify to every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book. If any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. Now, some people think this is a warning that you'll lose your salvation. Apostasy, an apostate, is somebody that claims to be a Christian or an Old Testament prophet like Balaam, the false prophet that the Jews actually killed later on. An apostate is somebody that claims that they know the Lord, but they don't know the Lord. That's why Jesus said they will do miracles and, and, and brag on me over in uh, Matthew 7 there. He said, but I will tell them, depart from me, you workers of iniquity, I never knew you. Yeah. So who would dare to change the Bible? Now, there are Christians, anybody here ever been backslidden? Don't be proud of it, put your hand down. <laughs> Some people are raising two hands. <laughs> A Christian that is not going to live by the Bible has no intention to change the Bible because they're not living by it anyway. 
They're just, they're just backslidden. But who would dare to change the Bible? Maybe Judge Russell. Yeah. Who is that guy? Yeah, he's the guy that started the Jehovah's Witnesses. Okay. Uh, how about Joseph Smith? Who's, who was that guy? <coughs> he started the Mormons. And and how about Mary Baker Eddy with uh, Seventh Day Adventists and the uh, what is the other group? The uh, Mary, Christian Scientists. Yeah. Those people, those lost people, will change this book. That's who he's talking about. Not saved people. He's talking about any man. But a saved man, a woman, is not going to, if they're backslidden, they're not going to spend their time changing the Bible because they don't have any intent to, to live it anyway. But apostates, they want to follow him. They want to be, you think that I am Jesus Christ. How many false Christs have we had come and go? And more still on the earth. Well, number four, let's go back to Proverbs and finish up here. How many want to go home as soon as possible? <laughs> Two more hands went up. <laughs> At least they're honest. How many can't wait to get home to eat leftovers? <laughs> <laughs> Just can't wait. All right, Proverbs 3. So we've seen the Word of God will purify us, it will protect us, it will prove us. Remember about the proving. If we obey it, it starts working for us. If we disobey it, it starts working against us. Brother Siles brought out a good point about the rich man in hell. And he, he tried to substitute the Word of God. He said, well, if Lazarus goes back and somebody from the dead goes to my brother's uh, they won't have to come to hell. And what did, what did Abraham tell him? They have Moses and the prophets. Let them, your five brothers, hear them. He was looking for the miracles, uh, some miraculous sign. And if you do not believe the Bible, you don't need a miracle. That won't convince you. So verse 7 to 9 here, we left off in verse 6. So fourthly, we see that the Word of God will, I like this one too, provide for us. When we're right with God and we're in the Word and the Word is in us, the gates of heaven will open. Two things have I required of thee. <coughs> the, the speaker here. Deny me them not before I die. Remove far from me vanity and lies. Give, give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with food convenient for me. That's called contentment, folks. Why are people making so many mistakes in their life that are Christians? Because either they want more than what God wants them to have, or they have... They're not getting a supply from God because of the way that they are living. So give me, I don't want to extreme, you know, there's a ditch on both sides of the road. It doesn't matter which side of the road you run off, you're still going to wreck your car. So he said, I need a balanced life here. Lest I be full, and then what? Deny thee, don't need God anymore. And say, who is the Lord? Or on the other side, or lest I be poor and do what? Steal and take the name of my God in vain and blame God for your problems. So it will provide for us. Go to Joshua 1 8. We have just a couple verses to see here. Joshua 1 8. God wants to provide for us. In the New Testament, it says God will provide for us exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. When we need something, God will show up. It doesn't mean that I want to get rich so I don't need God anymore. Or I, I, I want to be rich, then I'll start giving offerings to God. Well, that ain't going to happen either. But Joshua 1.8 says about pros, the prosperity, This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth. Joshua 1.8. So the word, the word, the word, the word. But thou shalt meditate there day and night, 
that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein, for then, not a moment earlier, for then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. Praise the Lord. Psalm 1 is a good repeat of that. Psalm 1, if we get over there about the blessed man. Psalm 1, talking about provisions of God. Blessed is the man, Psalm 1, 1. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. So, we see the doctrine of separation unto God, away from sinful lifestyle. It says, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. Here we go. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water, irrigated, that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. Everything's on time, right on time. His leaf also shall not wither, and what's, read this with me, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. Man, that's, that's easy living, as far as I'm concerned. That is good, that is good living. And then, as we finish up, look at John 15, 7. John 15, 7, where we were a little while ago, clean through the word. 15, 7, you say, well, you, you use so, so many Bible verses. They're not Bible verses. It's the Word of God. Yeah. Yeah. Why preach a message on the Word of God and, and say, well, there's too many, too many verses in the sermon? <laughs> oh, you, you've lost your mind. You've watched too many commercials. <laughs> 15, verse 7. If ye abide in me, now we're talking about provisions. If you abide in me, in other words, you're walking with the Lord. My words abide in you. You shall ask what you will, and it shall be done unto you. Isn't that a good verse? Amen. How many know the song that goes with that? How many don't know that song? Well, let's do it. If ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done. If ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done. Isn't that a good one? Okay, we will sing it again. I saw four boats out there. Here we go. All right, now sing it this time, all right? If ye abide in me and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done. If ye abide in me and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done. Think you can memorize that now? <laughs> I think so. Last verse, promise. Put my hand on the Bible. First Peter 1, 24 and 25. We must remember that our Bible is the word of God, and also it is God the word. 1 Peter 1, 24, we've looked at 22 and 23, and now the last two. <clears throat> For all flesh, 1 Peter 1, 24, all flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man as the flower of grass. The grass withereth, and the flower thereof falleth away, but, read it with me, but the word of the Lord endureth forever. And this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. Boy, if you think you like the scriptures, the guys who wrote it really like the scriptures. Read it again. But the word of the Lord endureth forever. 
And this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. Their Bible is the word of God and also it is God the word as well. Now Lord, we thank you for the end of this year. Help us to end it saturated with the word of God. Prepare ourselves to enter a new year saturated with the word of God and obedience to the word of God that you may bring the purity to us and the protection that we so need and keep us straight and not to lean left or right in changing the word. We ask you now to provide greatly for each one here and our nation. Give us the freedoms more than anything. Keep us a free people. Spread the word of God. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. Amen. Let's all stand and turn to page number 386. Page 386 as we sing, if you have a need, God will meet that need. If you abide in me, my words abide in you. I will do it. Page number 386. As we sing unto the Lord alone. Thank you.